Over 100 years ago, a poor, young Joseph Nathaniel Goddard set out from St. John Barbados to take his cow to Bridgetown to sell. Little did he know that journey would be the start of an enterprise that would take his descendants to parts of the world that, at that time, he could only read about. And so began a diverse corporation built on a sound foundation of loyalty, trustworthiness, and perseverance. Values that were passed from the founder and his wife Wilhelmina, who was a strong disciplinarian, to his children, his grandchildren, and is the very ethos on which he built the company with his son, Victor. In those days, life was not that structured as it is today in terms of giving information um, out about how best to do something. You had to more or less learn the hard way. You had to kind of observe, see, do, and, for, and things that didn't work don't do again type of thing. My father used to take me to the cheap side, where the cheap side market now is. We had a rum bond there. And we used to um, blend and bottle rum, both for domestic consumption and for export. In those days, we had two brands of rum, Gold Braid, which is what we mainly exported and sold to the top end of the market here in Barbados, and a brand called Top Notch. And when I went to the rum bottling barn as a small boy, I was probably only 13, 14, talking about, um, I would use the bottling machine. They had an old time bottling machine and you operated like if you were milking a cow. <laughs> it only handled a dozen bottles at a time, and you had to put the bottles up into these nipples. They would be filling all the time, and as they filled, you would remove them and pass them to someone who would then cap them and start to label them. All this was hand done. We didn't have a, a production line at that time. Being one of the younger ones, I came in and uh, when there were already three or four of my cousins in the business. John had come back, John Stanley had come back from Canada. Colin had come back from Canada. Richard was in the supermarket business. David Patterson, my, another cousin, he was in the food wholesale. Randall was in, had come back from Canada and they were mostly all Canadian trained. Richard and David Patterson also were Canadian trained in their fields. So um, I was a kind of exceptional, um, really different one because I was an English trained person and I, had, I was a lot younger than them. And then Philip also came back around just after I arrived. I think Philip turned up within a year. The first job was to fill in part of the Graham Hall swamp in Rendezvous. I had, they had bought at some time 10 acres of swamp land in there and a block of apartments exactly where um, or it's known as, I call it the Ernst & Young building, but it's right there at the corner of Rendezvous. That was a fairly big construction, earth moving job and I used, uh, I contracted out a lot, all the work. Nothing prepared me for that really. I mean, uh, my uh, university life was in mathematics and here I was being given 10 acres to recover, recoup from a swamp and bring it into dry land. When I first came back, Uncle Victor put me into the supermarket on Broad Street, where the Bank of Nova Scotia now is. He told me he wanted me to learn customs because the gentleman that used to do the customs would be retiring shortly, and he wanted me to take over the customs. But other than that, I was to learn the layout of the store or how everything, the modus operandi of the store. I used to keep the, the books in the little office at Goddard's on Broad Street. And the, all the meetings were held at Kensington. And when Uncle Vic wanted to hold a meeting, he would get hold of me one way or another, tell me, Colin, bring the minute book. 
uh, meet me at Kensington. That's all I heard. And I would go to Kensington. I would take the minutes, make some notes and so forth because I couldn't write shorthand. But I would take them home. And my wife, who was a qualified stenographer, she would type the minutes and I would take them back down with me next morning and stick them in the minute book. And I would take them and show them to Uncle Vic and let him read them and initial each page if he was satisfied with it so that when the next meeting came around there wouldn't be any fuss and bother about something any minutes, you know. From the modest start of a small grocery store on Prince William Henry Street in 1921 to the move to a larger and more prestigious location on Broad Street in just three years to the day to an international conglomerate operating in 26 countries. This organization has been built on lasting partnerships and agreements that have endured natural disasters, economic crises, and more. The company has witnessed outstanding growth in the last 100 years, due in large measure to many of these lasting partnerships. First, with the Marriott Corporation in the early days of the Flight Kitchen, and ultimately with LSG Sky Chefs, which now works with the company in 21 countries in Central and South America. Antiseptic Limited, trading as terrific tiles in Barbados, and now part of the building supplies division, which has gone from strength to strength since joining forces with GEL in 1977. Another family company that has now been passed on to the second generation. Caribbean Label Craft, the foremost printer of high quality labels in the Caribbean, exports labels for some of the region's most well known products. That association with GEL goes back some 35 years. One of the most recent agreements has been between Agostini's Limited and Goddard Enterprises with the formation of Caribbean Distribution Partners, CDP, a joint venture distribution company that exists in Trinidad and Barbados. This company, headed by a former GEL manager, has been growing steadily since its formation and is now one of the leading distribution companies in the Southern Caribbean. Our training had taken us and made us different to what the prior generation required of a job. And it was through our, our change that eventually we could manage a diverse business. As a group, we took a decision that we would move into the region more in the food area. And we began to acquire some additional businesses over the years. Um, a lot of the main principles that we had preferred to have a, a company representing them in the region that had its own kind of distribution outlets in each island. We went through a period of rapid acquisitions. We started a little, a, a little flight kitchen at the airport, Seawell Airport. And the business was so good for those few years that within three years we had to we had to treble the size of the flight kitchen. As the company grew and his sons and son-in-law continued to work in the business, and their sons returned from studying overseas in the late fifties and sixties the face of the company started to change. As it became more organized and got into new areas of endeavor, there was a need to reorganize and restructure the company, embracing talent other than that of family members, qualified professionals who would seek out other areas for the expansion of the business. A rigorous reorganization of the board took place in 1972 when the grandsons ascended to the board. These directors not only functioned on the GEL board, but many were now serving on the boards of various statutory corporations, regional companies, and umbrella organizations like the Chamber of Commerce. The Goddards were well regarded and recognized in corporate circles, in Barbados and regionally. John Stanley was knighted by the government and people of Barbados in 1993 for his contributions to commerce and the community and was instrumental in the establishment and the first chairman of the Barbados Private Sector Agency.
He was also one of the joint architects in the formation of the Tripartite Social Partnership that has become a fine example of private, public sector, labor partnership around the world. It was during this time when the company decided to hire and appoint managers with the highest level of skill, independent professional people who could take the company forward based on the values, commitment and dedication to the delivery of service for which the company had become known. The business had got relatively diverse for us in this small environment here. And you, you needed people who were well trained and who were good at managing it. And it was better to get the right person, likely not to be family, to run the business and make a success or keep making a further success of it, rather than, than have family in the job for the sake of having family in the job and not having a good job done. Up until then, the executive management team was almost exclusively Barbadians who had grown up within the company and largely who had never worked internationally. So we hired um, international agents to, to do the search and we decided that the, one of the criteria would be that we choose someone with international experience. We decided to look first regionally within the Caribbean as a first choice but we were determined that if we did not find the right candidate, we would extend the search globally. Um, we happened to find a Caribbean national um, with international experience in, in, in Tony Alley, and then so we were satisfied and did not look further. We always want best in class. We don't think about gender. We don't think about race. We don't think about geography. As we expand and we grow, we need executives who bring a truly international flair because that's where we're growing more and more. But we also bring, need executives who understand the spirit and the culture of the organization and who fit, and that's probably the most important thing, who fit the strategy of where we're going. They bring the right management style. And so, you know, we, every company has its own culture and style and we have one as well and I think it's extremely important that we continue to feed and develop that culture. The Goddard Enterprises Limited as a new trending global corporate um, entity always seeks to ensure that we recruit the best talent and ensure that we have the right fit as part of our cultural transformation. To ensure that we recruit right persons we tend to also focus on key leadership competencies and behaviors and so as we recruit and bring persons in we typically would do an evaluation to ensure that they meet to those competencies that lend to being the best leader going forward. The organization has also evolved from a family-run company to a multicultural, gender-mixed and racially diverse group, incorporating managers from all the various countries in which the company operates. I'm the Chief Financial Officer responsible for the entire group. So not just in Barbados, but the entire group, all the divisions. Um, I would have started in the group at a very young age, at the age of 23 years old. Um, I was recruited to be the financial controller of one of the subsidiaries, Hypat Limited, where I spent five and a half years there before I was promoted to group financial officer for one year. Then I acted in the position of chief financial officer for another year and then eventually I was um, given the position effective January 1st, 2008. Goddard's by its very nature of its businesses and the locations is a very diverse group. And that diversity then obviously allows you then obviously you recruit people in the various cultures. We have female managers at the top in some of these places. We have females in human resources, finance, um, even on the board. So Goddard's in itself, when you say Goddard's, you know, it, diversity is the name. So in 1973, the first management meeting brought together all of the managers from the various GEL subsidiary companies in the Caribbean into one space to plan and discuss the future. By 1978, 
as many as 78 participants from four islands came together for this now annual meeting to interact and share ideas and prepare performance plans for their companies. The meeting also served to examine market activity in the many segments of the company, set strategies for personnel and labor issues, and various policy positions to be shared across the group. That same year, there was a major restructuring of the company into divisions, and at the director's meeting of September 1978, a new name was adopted for the organization, and with the new seal, J. N. Goddard & Sons Limited became Goddard Enterprises Limited. By December 1979, 328,000 shares were offered to staff at $1 per share. The offer was oversubscribed, and so the organization was no longer a family-owned company, but a publicly traded corporation with over 1,000 employees as shareholders. Many people have been able to build wealth through the ownership of GEL shares. As a single $1 share then is the equivalent to 16 shares, and the current value of those shares would be $33.60 Barbados as of June 2021. The following year, in May 1980, 2.5 million shares were offered to the public at $2 per share, increasing the shareholder base and injecting capital into the business, making room for further expansion. So that by 1987, when the Barbados Securities Exchange opened, Goddard Enterprises Limited was one of the first local publicly owned companies to be listed on the exchange. Another major development in 1980, Goddard Enterprises welcomed its first two non-executive directors to the board, Mr. J.C. Armstrong, a senior lawyer, and Dame Elsie Payne, headmistress of Queen's College. But the composition of the board has changed over the years. When I joined the board in 2012, at that time the board was made up roughly 50% 50, 50 by executive, the executive management of the company and 50% by non-executives. And it was chaired by the former CEO of the company, Mr. Joe Goddard. And it was a natural evolution for a family company where the management, where the board, where the shareholders. Um, and at that stage, it was sparked by the fact that Mr. Joe was going to retire in a year. And at the same time, we decided that the board should transition to being an entirely non-executive board. And that the only executive that would stay on the board would be the CEO and the CEO would be the bridge between the board and the management. This, this meant that we also had to have a change in the functioning of the board because where the board used to very much focus on management type decisions, we were now taking those decisions and saying these belong to the management team. So the, what we've evolved into is a company where it, it is very, very clear that the driving force of running the company is the management. They are the professionals. They have been hired with the right expertise to run the company. And they recommend policy, strategy, and a budget to the board. And the board's input is pretty well restricted to approving policy and strategy and budgets and to the appointment of the CEO and to holding the CEO accountable for management carrying out the plans that they have brought to the board. It was not all clear sailing along the way. There were some areas in which the company got involved that were not always the right fit. And the directors recognized early that a mature business mind has to recognize its core competencies and exit those which are not. So, in the 100-year history of the organization, there are industries in which it served only for a time, like the hotel industry, where in the 1940s, as the global trend was towards tourism, the company acquired the prestigious Marine Hotel, followed by the Windsor, and then the Crane in St. Philip in 1950. 
However, by 1972, without a cadre of fully qualified hotel managers on the island, the company decided to sell the Marine Hotel. It is ironic that the last major function held there was the Goddard's 50th anniversary celebration. After the growth of the grocery business and the seeming success of one of the first self-serve supermarkets in the 1960s, Kensington Food Fair, popularly known as Goddard Supermarket, the company opened others on the south coast, namely the Rendezvous and Simpson supermarkets in Worthing. But eventually, the recession, along with the changing landscape of bigger and newer supermarket plants, forced the decision to get out of the supermarket business. The acquisition of the Crane Hotel unexpectedly led to the start of the Barbados Flight Kitchen. Trans-Canada Airways, the forerunner to Air Canada, approached the Crane and, because of the proximity to the airport, asked if they could provide some in-flight meals. They required only 40 coal meals for a once-per-week flight. That first delivery, on time and with good quality food, was the kernel that was the genesis for the Barbados Flight Kitchen, now a multinational division of GEL, with 34 companies operating in 21 countries, as far south as Uruguay and as far north as Miami, Florida. That first 40-meal delivery resulted in other airlines making similar requests, eventually leading to KLM, Pan American, and sometime later, BOAC, now British Airways, all having signed contracts with the Barbados Flight Kitchen. One major highlight of the company over the years is the catering of the first Concorde flight to the island, which was the Royal Silver Jubilee. But there was a much bigger vision for the Barbados Flight Kitchen. In 1975, I called in the management team to discuss the strategy for the future of the growth of the Barbados Flight Kitchen throughout the region. We had strengthened the uh, financial situation of the Flight Kitchen tremendously with Marriott's input, with the changes that they made in the operational and uh, fiscal audits that they provided uh, on a routine basis. At that meeting, I put a map up on the, uh, on the side of the wall and I said, we have to look at every place that it's possible to have a flight kitchen. And we can have the red locations are almost instantly operational. And we put those buttons in. And then I put some yellow ones up for the next ones that would be possible in the near future. And then I would look at the ones with white buttons, which were at the outside. And we went from the Bahamas to Bermuda, all the way down to Central America and Northern South America. And we discussed the possibility of where we would go and how we would do it. And I said, you know, you have to prepare yourselves to move out of Barbados to make this thing really grow. Well, it's the only way to grow. GL, specifically JCG, did a great job in terms of expanding uh, the business in Latin America. Uh, now the company has presence from Uruguay to Central America, lots of places in uh, South America, and of course, a very strong presence on the Caribbean. Uh, and the challenge uh, for that is how to move from being a regional company to become an international company, and then after that, to become a really global player uh, into that. When I came to here, uh, I got exactly the uh, challenge for uh, bringing some international expertise and bringing, let's say, expertise from a global company uh, 
to support GCG in terms of the process uh, on uh, the expansion that we have. Today, it's important to say that from the footprint perspective, GCG is the largest catering, airline catering company uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean. This is not on the revenue perspective, but from the presence that we have in the countries. Uh, and what we want to do is we want now to leverage this presence that we have in more than 20 countries to expand our business lines and reduce the dependence on just the airline catering, but expanding in different areas like industrial catering, hospital catering, ground handling, and other services uh, that we want to get. Because doing that, we will be able to become more and more international and looking into the future uh, with a less dependence of the airline industry. Today, as Goddard Enterprises Limited celebrates its 100th anniversary, the company can affirm how it has weathered the various crises encountered over this period. The strength, resilience, foresight, and pioneering vision of the founders has served the organization well to this very day. From those early days when the company forged ahead and introduced the first refrigerated room in Barbados, designed and built to store beef imported from Argentina, to the first motorized delivery vans, which allowed them to expand the delivery service island-wide from just bicycle and horse-drawn vehicle. At this present time, the company is still weathering modern-day disasters. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic shut down most countries worldwide. Airline travel was grounded. Cruise ships came to a halt, and the world went on pause. During this time, the people of the Caribbean also had to contend with the eruption of the La Soufriere volcano in St. Vincent. But again, the innovative spirit planted by the founders of this company still flourishes. It's forced us to reevaluate what we do, how we do it, it's forced us to reorganize and restructure internally within the businesses themselves. And so we're sitting on assets, we're sitting on capabilities that are unique in a lot of the Caribbean. And what we found is that we had to basically start to develop a way to diversify what we do. And so you, as an example, take a look at our flight kitchens. You know, what we do is we buy food, we transform food, and we serve food. You look at most of our manufacturing businesses, they do the same thing. We manufacture and we sell. Now, with the pandemic, people can't get out. People are afraid to get out. Um, you know, people, there are all sorts of security issues around the pandemic um, with lockdowns in place. And then you have the actual the vulnerable who are just fearful of going out and being exposed. So one of the things we decided to do is how can we transform our businesses into a digital type of media where we can transact with our customers um, electronically. You look at Courtesy Garage, we now have an electronic showroom. You can actually virtually go in and tour our showroom, look at cars, and even get in and do a test drive virtually. The future of the automotive division is that um, we are definitely going to be growing in terms of expanding the auto. Um, we are aligned with government's policy to support um, electrification of the industry. We sell um, Nissan and Hyundai, which are currently one of the two leading brands in electrification. Uh, we have the beautiful Leaf models, which have been out and proven and tested over the last eight years. And also the um, new, newly arrived Kona EV and hybrid models. So the automotive division is perfectly aligned with what the future has to hold. You look at our kitchens, and again, what we've done is we've created a website, what I call a mall, an electronic mall, and most of our companies that sell food are now listed on that website. It's called orderupgo.com, and on it you can find Wings on Wheels, you can find GCG Events, you can find Purity, you can find McBride, you can find Hanshel Innes. So you can now shop for your groceries, buy food. If you're working at home and you're going to be late and you know you're not going to be able to get to the grocery in time because it's closing early because of the COVID, 
you can now order food and have it delivered at a specified time. And our intent is to push that envelope into how do we transform from brick and mortar to a click and mortar type of business. We're launching a new website in building supplies, which will basically allow the exact same thing. We will continue to focus on organic growth within the markets that we exist um, presently. We are market leaders and our leadership in these positions have, have largely been driven by a strong sense of integrity, a strong sense of fairness, and espousing the values that Goddard Enterprises as a whole cherishes daily. Goddard, however, has lifted for us the quality and expectation of business in, in our markets. Goddard does not beat a big drop. It lets the companies that it has acquired do its talking for it. Um, and we believe strongly that we are highly respected because of all the values and all the commitment, the discipline and the commitment to fairness that we have demonstrated time and time again over the last 50 years. We have some very ambitious and, and aggressive plans to build out the division. We plan on making significant uh, investments in our current plant and equipment, um, reduce costs, improve efficiencies, consistency of quality, uh, increase uh, our capacity, um, not only so that we can continue to grow our current market share, but so that we can enter into new markets, uh, new export markets. We are already in over 50 export markets around the world. We ship our products as far as China and Japan. And, um, but there's more opportunity, obviously, a lot more opportunity in 50 countries. So um, we believe that by making that investment, we will be able to um, be more competitive in some of the export markets and enter new markets. And necessarily, when you grow, you have to hire more people. It's about changing the type of job, really. In the coming weeks and months ahead, I will endeavor to transform the shipping division into a global supply chain solutions network with the express freight services location in Miami being the hub of that network. It will be our mission to provide um, excellent global supply chain services, not only to the Goddard's group of companies, but also to leverage that those resources, that infrastructure, to provide global supply chain solutions to third parties as well. I see us expanding um, over the next 10 to 20 years into other geographic regions. So, from that very first customer who purchased a gallon of rum and some salt fish in that small grocery store in Bridgetown on October 13, 1921, to over 60 companies operating in 26 countries, Goddard Enterprises Limited has grown through the perseverance of its founders, the loyalty of its staff, and the vision of its management teams. The company has weathered the first 100 years and looks forward with anticipation to the challenges and the opportunities of the next century.